we know the creation. Isn't creation amazing? Creation. And the idea that we are created is a beautiful idea. There's a documentary I recommend. It's called Is Genesis History? You can, I think it's still on YouTube, but it's a fantastic documentary. I honestly have never seen uh, as good a presentation on creation, and really a lot of it is pointing toward the, towards the flood, uh, and the, all the studies are in it. There's geologists and biologists and marine biologists and computer scientists, and all these guys are in there, and they're coming to one conclusion. But creation, the idea that we have been created by God and we have been created to be in fellowship with God. But then here in Genesis chapter 3, that fellowship is uh, is interrupted, right? It is challenged and uh, the devil is working. It says in verse 1, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Uh, more cunning than anyone, he must have been good, right? Like we, I, you know, we don't like to give the devil a lot of credit, but also we don't want to be naive to his cunning, craftiness. But can you imagine that you are in perfect creation, absolutely perfect, and daily walking with God in the garden, having fellowship with the voice of the Lord? And that there is something that is able to persuade you away from that. That's got to be a a powerful uh, deceit or a powerful presentation. You know, we picture him as the, you know, the snake oil salesman, right? Like the guy you see him coming from a mile away, and you say, "I don't, I don't trust anything that guy's about to say." Right? You know, those guys are jingling change in his pocket, and you know, the whole scene, the stereotype is there. But the devil is not that way, that he is very cunning and very persuading and very patient. And he is working here and he is able to deceive Eve. He said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of the tree of the garden, of every tree of the garden? There it is. The first question, doubt, doubt is introduced. Has God said Man, how how many times has the devil presented that question? Has God said? Have you heard it in your own experience and in your own walk of faith? Have you heard that whisper or has it come from somewhere? Has God really said? Can you really trust the Bible? And how many times has that come up in conversation on the street? Then how can I trust the Bible? It's man-made. It's written. It's called the King James Version. What do you? Come on. It's man. It's it's translated by man. It's fallible. Right? It's fallible. But the response to that is, God has said, and if God is worthy of my worship, then is it too difficult for Him to preserve one book? Right? Like we're talking about the God of creation and the God that I will worship, is one book too difficult? Right? If preserving one book is too difficult, then He's not worthy of my worship. But He can do it. He, he has done it. And when we look at this word, we look at it as infallible and perfect and preserved so for God's communication to us. But this will always be the charge against us and it will always be there and it will, the devil will always be bringing doubt into my relationship with God. Has God said that he really, does he really love you? Does he really, you know, you have done this, that, and that, and this today only? He's always bringing up the things, the little activities, the, the the inconveniences. And he says, "Are you really think God loves you? You think He wants to hear from you right now? Has He really said that you are saved? How about that one, that comes up all the time. Doubting my salvation, doubting my place with Christ, doubting my access to the throne of grace. Has God said?" It's a convincing argument. That's why the devil still uses it. They say, why does he waste his time? He doesn't waste his time. He's he's caught a lot of people with these lies and with these little doubts. But we have, by the time we get to the end of this chapter, we learn that we can have great confidence in God because of His grace, grace towards us. 
<clears throat> the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has says you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. It's a little embellishment. Eve's, Eve's like de- listening to the doubt. All God said was don't eat it. And she brings it a little further. He said, yeah, I can't even touch it. Like he's encouraging the uh, the offense almost, right? Like the devil would love for me to be offended by what God says to me. He, he said I couldn't even touch it. He, I couldn't even do that. Did it say that? No, it doesn't say that. But it's going. It's 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 being encouraged. Then the serpent said to the woman, "Ah, oh, come on, come on, you won't die. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. Just go for it. It looks good, doesn't it? That's what it says. It looks good. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil." So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and it was desirable to make one wise. There you go. There is the the heart of man right there. That is how we are drawn away from fellowship with God so easily. It is good food. It's beautiful. And it will make you wise. There are the little traps along the way to draw me away from the simplicity of my faith in Christ. So she took the fruit and she ate it, and then she gave it to her husband, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. There's the death, right? The physical death would would be coming, what, some 900 years later. (laughs) Still long life, but yeah, they would eventually die physically, but the spiritual death is there immediately there's another great book i love it's called um the chronicles of mansoul what's it called now the new title holy war great book the chronicles of mansoul it's a john bunyan parody not parody (laughs) allegory it's not a weird al song it's a john bunyan allegory and he is writing about uh the soul of man and how it is under attack by uh diablos and it's interesting that he has each part of the soul is represented in the in the town, and the attack of Diablos against like the conscience. I think the first the first attack is against innocence, and then he go he locks up the conscience in the tower. Uh, he opens the ear gate, he opens the eye gate, and then he finds his way into the city. It's amazing. It's it's so fun to read and to picture. Like this is our our soul. And this is the death that happens. Innocence is slaughtered right here. And they are covering themselves. They are sowing fig leaves. And they are covering themselves because they are ashamed. They had never been ashamed up until this point. But now their sin exposes them. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. They hid themselves. Why? Because of their shame, because of their sin, because of the doubt that they now had about the character and nature of God. But now, now they are going to learn something more about the character and nature of God, actually. That because of sin, they learned something more about God. That they were in fellowship with God and it was perfect. There was no, no uh, Paul says, no spot on the feast. Right? There's no blemish. But now that there is, they learn something new about God. They are introduced to His grace immediately. Immediately. I love that. Isn't that so good? That God doesn't leave Adam and Eve to themselves for, you know, for four months or something. Let them really stew in their sin. Let them really get accustomed to hiding behind the bushes. Let them really get used to sowing the fig leaves. No, He comes to them in in the, the time where they are at their lowest. And He speaks to them immediately. Where are you? The Lord called to Adam and He said to him, Where are you? Where are you? Can you hear the grace and the voice of God when He says this? 
we, we could uh, picture it in different ways. Uh, there are a few statements that I can't wait to hear how they were said in the Bible. Right? The tone of voice, the, the inflection, the, the face as it was said. One of them is when Christ was on the cross and he said it is finished. Another one is here when Christ, God says, where are you, Adam, for the first time? Where are you? The first time that you've doubted my love for you, the first time that you've doubted your right to fellowship with me, the first time that you have been ashamed of yourself and you've hid yourself from me. We could think that God would say, Hey! Hey! In anger, Where are you? But I like to think that it was consistent with the nature and character of God and that it was gracious. And that His approach to man in his sin is gracious and he is calling him out of his sin not not pushing him further into it and he is there where are you and he gave up quick isn't that interesting he couldn't he couldn't handle it adam he said oh i'm right here behind the rhododendron bush right. i'm right here right here you got me and think that that even that brief time for adam and eve must have felt like an eternity when they are used to fellowship and they are used to closeness, to have any distance or any uh, time where there is no, there, the response isn't immediate, to have any time would be difficult. Now there there are great spans of time where we are dis, distant from God, and then we hear His voice calling us. But Adam comes out and he says, "I hid because I was naked." Who told you you were naked? Who told you that? Have I I never told you that. Did somebody else tell you? What did Adam do? It's her fault, right? She did it. The woman that you gave me, right? There's like a double blame in this one. First of all, she did it first, and then second of all, remember you gave her to me, right? This is really your fault, God, right? <laughs> The woman, she gave it to me and I ate it. God said, what is it that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. Okay. It's all getting passed around. So look what happens. God doesn't deal with that. Isn't that interesting? That He doesn't sit down and sort out the details. He doesn't sit down and say, okay, well, let's get to the bottom of this. Adam, what do you have to say? Eve, what do you have to say for yourself? Okay, Let's figure this out and then we'll figure out the penalties. No. He turns immediately to the serpent, actually. He turns to the serpent. What a relief to us to know that God has dealt with the devil and that he doesn't leave it up to us and he doesn't leave us on a, uh, on a battleground with the devil in this world. But he deals with the devil and he speaks to him, and here, the promise of the seed, the promise of the Messiah, actually is not a promise given to Adam and Eve, but it's a promise spoken to the devil in judgment of the devil, and Adam and Eve are present to hear it. So my, my, uh, my work in my salvation is not to produce anything, but it is to recognize what God has said. And to rest in what God has said. That the defeat of the devil is by no means put on the shoulders of Adam and Eve. Imagine if that was the deal. God said, okay, Adam and Eve, you two come here, sit down. We're going to get to the bottom of this, right? And Adam is like, well, 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 she did it and you gave it to me. Whoa, 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 okay. Eve, what do you have to say? And they go back and forth and then he says, okay, Eve, this is what you have to do. Adam, this is what you have to do. Once you guys are done, I'll come back and see how you're doing. No. He turns to the devil and he says, You little sly man, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust. Have you ever told anyone to eat dust? I don't know. I don't know if I have. We could tell the devil to eat dust. You know, all the days of your life. And I will put en enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That's it. That's it. That's all he has to say. And what is it? Of course, that's the 
uh, the statement and the promise of the Messiah coming, Christ coming, and dealing a blow to the devil and ultimately defeating him. But the enmity would be there between the devil and the uh, and man. All right, the struggle would be there, but the victory that will be over him will be coming from God. He will do it. He will do it. And then that is the last we hear from the little serpent. That's the last thing we hear. He is basically dismissed from the conversation. I love that. That my relationship with God is not hindered or not uh, dependent on the devil balancing it out. Isn't that good? God comes to me and He says, Hey, I have something for you. And we don't have to check in with the devil and say, What do you think about this? Is this a good idea? Or am I allowed to do this? Or is there anything that would hold me back from this? Like there is no, there is no filter there. There is no diversion to Him. He is not welcome in the conversation. He is not welcome in the, in the relationship. He tries. He comes at it. Right? He is always challenging it. He tries to get me to doubt it. Why? Because if I can doubt it, then he has an angle. He has a little foothold. But when I put my faith in the words that God has spoken, then he has no space. He has no place. And uh, Pastor Gary Grunwald said years ago, he said that the devil likes to play in the space between between people. Right? We could think of it in a relationship when there's a little bit of distance and I feel a little disconnected from somebody. There's a lot that can happen in that space, can't it? Like between subjectivity and insecurity, like a lot of stuff can be stirred up that really isn't there. It's like a little game the devil likes to play. That's why we talk about unity and the unity of the Spirit because there's no space there. And when God brings us together, and then if we think of my relationship to God, the devil likes to put space there, using condemnation and using guilt and using shame so that I feel like I don't have an approach to God. And then he plays in that little area there. And that's where the doubt is introduced and the little, like, the little chirping begins and then all of a sudden I find myself distant from God. But God brings us close and He dismisses the devil and he, there's no place for Him here. And actually there's no response from Him either. That God speaks, I think, I think nine times God speaks in Genesis chapter 3. The devil has no response to any one of them. He is gone. He doesn't have a thing. Like there's no negotiation. There's no like there's no appeals. Are you hear of these guys in in the in the NFL or in you know whatever sports and they get they get suspended and then they file an appeal and it's extended and then you know all this stuff goes on. There's no none of that. There's none of that. He's out of there. And then God turns to Adam. Then he said to Adam in verse 17, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Imagine what it was like in the Garden of Eden. I don't know how many types of food there are in the world. Does anybody know off the top of their head? There's millions of different fruits and vegetables. We don't even probably we don't even know what some of them are. And I don't know how people have figured out the things that you can eat, right? You ever look at something and, you know, there's no, nothing that would say this is going to be edible, right? Like there's nothing that says this is going to be fantastic and sweet. You just have to crack open the shell. Like who was the adventurous person that said, I wonder if I crack this open, there's going to be something juicy inside of it, right? But there are millions, and they didn't have to do anything. They didn't have to cultivate. They could just walk along and eat whatever they wanted. But now there's toil, and there is work involved, and there's thorns and thistles and mosquitoes and all that kind of stuff. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the herb of the field. But still, it's still there though, isn't it? That's gracious. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, uh, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Verse 16, To the woman he said, 
I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. All right. There we go. Big difference there for Eve's experience on earth. But then it says, And Adam called his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. For the Lord God said, Behold, man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden till the ground from which he was taken. To till the ground. So he drove man out and he placed the cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Okay, so there, there is the root of all of our problems. There is... There is what is happening in the world today. Right? We look out there, what is wrong with the world today? There you go. There it is. That uh, because of Adam, he is the head of humanity. Because of Adam in his sin, Romans chapter 5, all have sinned. All are short. All of us are lost. All of us are guilty. But also, as soon as you see man fall, you see God arrive. And you see God speak to man. God doesn't condemn man. There are consequences, yes. There are problems because of it, yes. But there is a provision. There is a promise. The first thing that is given is the promise. Right Before the consequences are there, there is the promise given that there will be another and that through Him will come the Messiah, will come the victory, will come life again. It's all given. And this is this is who we serve, and you can find it throughout the Bible. You, you look, you know, you go on to Abraham, you go to Moses, you go to Joshua, you go to Joseph, you go to all of these characters in the Bible, all of these uh, people that we see and we see the story of their life. We see the same thing: that God is near, God is present, God is with them, God is leading them in something different, and He's leading them in the confidence. Of his, of his mercy and the confidence of His grace and the confidence of His promise towards them. Because nowhere in Genesis chapter 3 does it say, if you guys, Adam and Eve, if you guys hold up your end of the bargain, then I will deliver another seed to you. No. No. There is simply, there will be enmity, but He will crush your head and you will bruise His heel. And there is, a, there is the confidence and the work of God given. Then we see Cain and Abel are born. Hallelujah. There they are. There's the boys. Which one of them will be the one? Which one of them will be the one to overcome the serpent? Well, Cain kills Abel. So it can't be Abel. And it's not going to be Cain. So what, what are we going to do now? Seth is born. Seth is born. And then you can follow from Seth all the way to Christ. You can follow the line. It's amazing. It's amazing. And Seth's son Enos, right? not Jack, Enos, right? he is the one, and it says, from that point on, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Worship. Worship is there. Why? Because God is there. And God's presence with them uh, has a response, and that response is worship. So very since the very beginning... Since the beginning of all of this stuff, there has been an understanding of God's presence with us and His desire and His grace and His healing and His remedy for the fall. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's all we have to say tonight. And we could look at, look at Christ being sent here to the earth and it's not a reaction. Right? Like we, could, we could think that God is reacting to us. Or are you saying, okay, they're doing that now. I didn't see that coming. What am I going to do about that? But we can find it all the way back to the very uh, first people where sin was introduced, grace is introduced. And then every step of the way since that has been God's grace in His dealings with man. So, hallelujah. Well, how much confidence can we have in the grace of God? Oh, man, we can have a lot of confidence in it. Oh man, 
We, because this book, every story that we find, every person that we see, the dealings of God with man is gracious. It's consistent with his character. Um, so that's why we have these stories. Right? More than stories, we have this history. And, this, and through studying this history of God with man, we have confidence in him. And uh, the doubt will always come, right? Has he really said? Has he said? And we say, yep. Yeah, he said it. Yes, he did. And I believe it. Isn't that a song? He said it, I believe it. There we go. Look, we're all songbirds in here tonight. It's a great a great statement of faith. He said it, and I believe it. Billy Graham said it, didn't he? When I, in simplicity, say God says, there's there's a difference in my preaching. So, by faith, we go. Right? By faith, we overcome by faith we face the obstacles and we we tune out the doubt of the devil by faith uh, by taking these promises that he's given us and applying them in our life amen amen lord thank you for uh this word thank you for um this chapter and your quick response to our sin lord thank you thank you thank you Help us to hear your words uh, and help us tune out the doubt by faith in your words, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.